You know, as a child, uh, growing up, I never understood the term Good Friday. I go, what is so good about Good Friday? Jesus gets beaten, whipped, tortured, dies on a cross, buries in a grave. What's so big, what's a big deal? Why is it such good news? I didn't understand the benefits to me. That's the good part. And maybe you don't understand the benefits to you. There are crosses everywhere. They're a symbol of hope all around the world. They're on hospitals. They're in graveyards. They're in military graveyards with literally thousands and thousands of crosses. Millions, no, billions of people wear a cross around their neck. What is the big deal about Good Friday and the cross? Why is it such a symbol of hope? Do you ever feel that um, you can't get it all done in life? that you can't finish it all, that you go, I just, there's not enough money, not enough time, not enough energy. I just can't get it all done. Well, the truth is the world is filled with unfinished projects, unfinished work, unfinished jobs. I took my kids one uh, year on vacation to go see Mount Rushmore. It's one of our national monuments. It's not finished. <laughs> my youngest son, Matthew, goes, Dad, when are they gonna finish it? Well, probably never, and it's gonna remain unfinished. You will die with unfinished business in your life. Only one person in all of history has ever died with their life completely fulfilled and their mission in life completely completed, and that was Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of times they make movies about Jesus, and they make it sound like he had some kind of identity crisis, that he was kind of confused about what he was, what he did, that he didn't really know what he was supposed to do, you know, had to kind of figure it out. That's nonsense. And this weekend they'll be playing on TV, uh, Jesus Christ, a superstar. Great music, terrible theology. <laughs> don't, don't ever get your theology from a Broadway play, okay? <laughs> Jesus knew exactly what he was gonna do. And when he was 12 years old, even as a child, he could say to Mary and to Joseph, I must be about my father's business. He already knew what he was here on earth to do. And when he starts his ministry, he says this, if you'll take out your message notes, they're inside um, your program or in your little bag. The first verse on there, John 4, 34, Jesus says this, I came to finish the work that my father sent me to do. I came to finish the work that my father sent me to do. And obviously, uh, he did finish it. That's why billions of people will celebrate Easter this weekend. At the end of his life, while he's suffering on the cross, he said the next verse, knowing that everything was now complete and that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, he's hanging on the cross when he says this, I'm thirsty. And then after he was given a drink, he shouted, it is finished. He literally shouts it, it is finished. It is finished, it's complete. And with this, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now I want you to notice three things looking at that verse. First, notice he did not say, I am finished. He says, it is finished. The reason he didn't say I'm finished because he wasn't finished. I mean, he came back to life in three days, he's alive in heaven today, and, uh, and so Jesus was not finished himself. He didn't die permanently. It wasn't, he wasn't saying, I'm finished, he's saying, it is finished. What, what's finished, what's completed? What job is done? Well, that's what we're gonna look at today. Now, the second thing I want you to notice is that it says, after he, he, he said it, actually notice the second thing, he shouted it. He shouted it, it is finished. This is not a whimper of defeat. This is a battle cry of victory. He's not saying, oh, finally, it's over. It's finished. It's done. Huh, I made it to the finish line. No, it says he shouted it. It is finished. This is a battle cry going, I did it. I did it. I finished the job I came to earth to do. It is a shout of victory, not a whimper of defeat. And notice that after that it says, then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Notice, Jesus voluntarily dies. Who murdered Jesus? Nobody murdered Jesus. He gave his own life. Listen, Jesus was not a martyr. He was a savior. 
A martyr is somebody who dies for what they believe in and they, somebody takes their life from them. Nobody took Jesus' life from him. He willingly gave it up. If Jesus hadn't wanted to go to the cross, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. If he hadn't wanted to die, he wouldn't have died. He's the son of God. He willingly gives up his life. Now in history, friends, there has never been three more words more important than it is finished, never. These are the three most important words in your life, whether you realize it or not. These are the three most important words in your life. If Jesus Christ had not said, it is finished, you would have no hope, you would have no purpose for today, no power for your problems, no peace in your heart, no place in heaven, uh, no pardon for your sin. None of these things would be true if Jesus had not said, it's finished. I did it. I completed the job that I was given to do. And so it, these are literally the most important words in history. If you get this, you get Christianity in a nutshell. This is what Jesus is all about. If you understand, it is finished. Now the irony is that at this moment when Jesus said it, nobody got it. Nobody understood it. When Jesus shouts out on the cross, it is finished, uh, the Roman soldiers hanging around are going, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, this radical revolutionary is finished. And uh, Pilate, the governor, is going, yeah, this political headache is finished. And the, the uh, religious leaders are going, yeah, our competition is finished. Even the disciples are going, yeah, the dream is finished. It's there, it's dead on the cross. Even Satan didn't get what's going on here. And he's going, I've won. When Jesus cried out, it's finished, he thought, I have killed the Son of God. Evil has won, victory is mine. I am now king of the universe. I've killed God. So what was Jesus really finishing when he says it is finished on the cross? Well, I need to explain to you that in the Greek, and the, the Bible was written in Greek, and when Jesus said these words, he's saying it in Greek. In the Greek, in the ancient Greek, it is finished is just one word. It is the word to telestai. To telestai. And literally what Jesus said, if you'd been at the foot of the cross, you would have heard him shout, to telestai. One word, which means it is finished. This is a very common word in ancient times. It's used by everybody. If you were a um, servant, when you had finished all your work, all your jobs, all your chores, all your assignments, you'd come in to your boss, your master, and you'd say, to telestai, I've, I've completed the work, it's, it's all done. If you were a judge, this is a legal term, a judge would bang a gavel, and when somebody had paid their sentence, they'd served their time, they had paid their debt to society, they'd bang the gavel down and they'd say, to telestai, which meant justice has been served, your debt has been paid. Your deed to society has been taken care of. You've served the time. To tell us die. It's a legal term. They would stamp it on your prison sentence, commuting your prison sentence. Time served. You're, free, you're a free man. Um, if you were an accountant, it's an accounting term, and it literally meant paid in full. And archaeologists have found this word to tell us die over all kinds of documents. They stamp it on bills that are paid. If you paid off your house, your mortgage would be stamped to tell us die. If you paid your taxes, your tax bill to Rome would be stamped to tell us die. Paid in full. You've paid off your debt. If you were an artist, when you put the final touch on that painting or on that sculpture and it's completely finished, the piece de resistance, it's all done you would shout out or say to Telestai. The work of art is finished, it's complete, it's done. If you were a priest and you were doing the sacrifice of the lamb in the temple and at the end of that sacrifice, the, sh the priest would shout out to Telestai, meaning, meaning the offering has been made. Now every one of these explanations that I just gave you are all metaphors of the cross and what Jesus was saying when he said to Telestai. So what did Jesus actually finish? Well, I could give you a long list. For instance, uh, in the Old Testament, that's the part of the Bible before Jesus, there are about 380 prophecies where God says, um, 
I'm gonna tell you that I'm gonna send a savior to save you for your sins, uh, and here's how you're gonna know it's the real savior, it's the real Messiah, it's not a fake Messiah, not a fake savior. And he gave 380 prophecies. Jesus fulfilled every one of those to Telestite. There are literally thousands of promises in the Bible from God to you. And the Bible says that Jesus fulfilled all of those promises to you. 2 Corinthians 1.20, look up here on the screen. All of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ. So I could literally make a list of hundreds of things that to tell us time means when it means it's finished. But to understand the cross, I want, it, I want you to just understand three or four things uh, this afternoon. Now, to understand the meaning of to tell us time, you need to understand three things. God is a God of order and laws. God is a God of justice and fairness. And God is a God of love and forgiveness. And all three of them are true. First, God is a God of laws and order. The universe is not chaos, it runs by certain laws. And when God established the laws, there are physics, laws of physics, there are laws of mathematics, there are laws of biology, uh, there are laws of chemistry. These, who do you think made up these laws? God made them up, he created the universe. There are physical laws, there are spiritual laws, there are relational laws, there are moral laws. God gave the moral laws to Moses, and the Jews, and they're supposed to give them to the rest of us. But God gave these laws, uh, and he expects them to be obeyed. Now, when you disobey them, uh, it causes all kinds of chaos, because when you break the rules, they don't actually, you don't actually break the rule, they break you. For instance, there's certain rules about how much sleep you need to get. If you don't get it, who, do you, who gets hurt? Not God, you hurt your body. If you don't eat right, you break the rules, you hurt your body. And, and so, when we don't do it God's way, we're the one who gets hurt, not God. It's like the guy who said, I don't believe in the law of gravity. He jumps off a 50-story building to prove it's wrong. 20 stories down, a guy looks out the window and goes, how's it going? He goes, well, so far, so good. <laughs> and a lot of people are living their life that way, but one day they're gonna hit splat. And he didn't break the law of gravity, it broke him. It broke him. So God is a God of order and laws. Now, when you have laws, laws are worthless unless there's a punishment or a penalty, if, if anybody can break the laws and get away with it, that's not fair. God is a God of fairness and a God, a God of justice. Now, I wanna see true confession here. How many of you have ever said this in your lifetime? It's not fair. How many have ever said that? Yeah, every one of you have said that. It's, where did you get that idea? Where did you get that sense of fairness? It came from God. Cows never say, it's not fair. <laughs> Horses, ants, slugs never say, it's not fair. The only reason you have a sense of fairness in you is because you're made in God's image. And God is a fair God. God doesn't like unfairness. God is a God of justice. He's a God of laws, that means he's righteous, that means he's always right. And he's a God of justice and fairness that goes, that's not fair. Is it right for people to get away with murder? No, that's not fair. Is it right for people to hurt you and, and not have any uh, a penalty for it? No, that's not fair. Where did that come from? It came because you're made in God's image and you have, as a human being, an inborn sense of fairness. And when you see injustice, you see prejudice, and you see things like that, well, then you, you get upset about it. Well, so does God. Now, here's the problem. God created all these perfect laws, but as human beings, we are unable to keep any of them. Completely. We all break the laws all the time. We break all the rules all the time without his help. And of course we have. And the Bible says, uh, so there's a, a penalty for that. And the Bible says the wages of sin is, is death. But that's the bad news. Here's the good news. The third thing about God is he's loving and he's forgiven, forgiving. And that's the first thing Jesus came to do on the cross. To pay the penalty and cancel the debts that you owed. Write this down. He paid my penalty and he canceled my debt on the cross. That's the first thing that happened. There are laws, we've all broken the laws, and God says somebody's gotta pay, either you or somebody else, and God says, I tell you what, I'll just do it myself. I'll pay the penalty for you. I'll serve your time, I'll do your rap. I will pay your debt for you. 
Romans chapter eight in the Bible says this, verse three and four. The law of Moses could not save us. That's like the 10 commandments and all the laws in the Old Testament because of our sinful nature. But God put into effect a different plan to save us. He sent his own son in a human body like ours, that's Jesus. And he gave his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus hadn't committed anything wrong as he dies for our sins. And God did this so that the requirements of the law would be fully accomplished for us who no longer follow our sinful nature but instead follow the spirit. What's the requirement of the law? Fairness and justice. God demands fairness. It's not fair to break the law and get away with it. So God says, I'll do it myself, and Jesus died so you wouldn't have to pay for any of your sins. That's good news. That's what Good Friday is all about. That's the first thing. Now look at these verses. Hebrews chapter nine in the Bible, verse 15. Christ died to set people free from the penalty of the sins they committed under that first covenant. So everything you've ever done wrong, Jesus paid for on the cross. But more than that, he not only forgave you, he not only uh, paid your penalty, he wiped out your account. Look at the next verse, Colossians 2.15. God wiped out the charges. He wiped out the charges against you and canceled the record of all the times we've disobeyed God's commandments. So he canceled the record. It doesn't even exist anymore. Jesus took our guilt on his body and nailed it to the cross. That's the good in Good Friday. That's what he came to accomplish, the first of many things. Now imagine if you went home today and, and you got a phone call and you picked it up and they said, hi, this is a MasterCard. Uh, we have decided to um, cancel uh, all the record of your debt. It's all wiped out, it's scot-free. In fact, we have closed your account so you don't have any debt anymore. Would you be happy about that? Yeah, this is why Good Friday is good. It just, you weren't just forgiven, it's wiped out. Some of you think that God's up there in heaven mad at you about something you did in the past. It's already been forgiven and forgotten. There's no record of it. When you get to heaven, God's not gonna come up and say, now about that sin you did uh, in whatever year, in fact, if you bring it up, God, about that sin in that year, he's gonna go, what are you talking about? The record's been canceled. It's not only been paid off, there is no record of it. God has forgiven it, he's done more than that, he's forgotten it. Is that good news? That God is not mad at you because all that Jesus did on the cross, he paid for all your sin. And listen, he didn't just pay for the ones you've already done, he's paid for the ones you haven't done yet. Hello. The ones you're gonna do this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow, next week, and the next years of your life, they're already paid for. It is finished. It's not like you paid for some of your sins and not the ones in the future. Those have already been paid for too. It is finished. One time uh, Kay and I were on vacation and I came down in the morning from a hotel room to pay off the bill and uh, the attendant lady said, uh, well, the bill's been paid. I said, why? She goes, well, it's been paid by somebody else. I said, who? She said, well, that guy right there. There's another guy standing, and he said, I didn't know this guy from Adam. And he said, I just recognized you, and I just want to do something nice, and I've just paid off your hotel bill. I said, you are my new best friend. <laughs> Jesus ought to be your new best friend. He just paid off everything you've ever done wrong and it was paid 2,000 years ago. So that means this, listen very closely, there is no need for you to try to keep repaying God for the things you've done wrong because it's already been paid. How long do you remember a bill that's been paid in full? You don't. Oh, that electric bill from last month. No, it's, once it's paid, you forget it. I heard a true story of an elderly lady who uh, her husband died and she called uh, the life insurance company and she said, um, I'm so sorry, I'm embarrassed about this, but I live on limited income and uh, I can't afford to keep paying uh, uh, my husband's life insurance. Uh, he died five years ago and I, I just can't afford to pay it on my own. <laughs> and, and the guy, the life insurance agent had to explain a mem we're supposed to be paying you. 
not you paying us, that's done. There's a thing called death benefits, and that means the moment the person dies, you start getting all the benefit from it. On the cross, you get all the death benefits of Jesus' death. You're getting the death benefits now. One of them is forgiveness for everything you've ever done wrong. Do you deserve it? Of course not. Do I deserve it? Of course not. That's called grace. God is righteous. He always does the right thing. He's just, somebody's gotta pay, because it's not fair for somebody to just get off scot-free. So he says, I'll pay for it myself. He's loving, he's kind, and he's forgiving. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter five, verse nine. After Jesus had finished his work, he, what, finished what work? The work on the cross. He became the source of eternal salvation for everyone who obeys him. Now, that's one of the benefits that makes Good Friday good. Number two, you know, I write this down. Second thing Jesus finished on the cross when he said it is finished is this. He defeated the fear of death. On the cross, he defeated the fear of death. In other words, you don't have to fear death anymore, and let me explain why. Now, because death uh, is universal, the mortality is rate 100%, we're all gonna die, um, then the fear of death is universal. I hate to tell you this, but we're all terminal. You know, people say, well, he's terminal. He's got a terminal illness. You have a terminal illness. Nobody's gonna live forever on this planet. And only a fool would go through life unprepared for something you've known since you were a baby is gonna happen. You're gonna die. I'm gonna die, you're gonna die. You weren't meant to last here on this earth forever. You're meant to last forever, just not here. And so, if we're all terminal, then why are we, and we know it's all gonna happen to everybody, why are we so fearful about it? Because we don't know what's gonna happen unless you've read this book. And then, then you know. Now, you don't have to fear death if you accept what Jesus did for you on the cross because you're not afraid to meet God because your penalty's been paid and your death's been canceled. You're not afraid to meet God. Now, if you don't know that, you are afraid to meet God because you got a lot of things to do explaining. But if you realize, I'm not gonna have to do an explaining if I've trusted in Christ because he's paid for all my sins, there's no explaining. It's just welcome in, let the party begin. Let's start. So there's no fear. Look at what the Bible says about this, Romans chapter five. The sin of one man, that's Adam, he got us in all this trouble, caused death to rule over us. But all who receive God's wonderful, gracious gift of righteousness will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. In the next verse, Hebrews chapter two, 14 and 15. Jesus became flesh and blood by being born into the, in human form. God came in human form. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. And the devil who had the power of death, only in this way could he, Jesus, deliver those who have lived all of their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. When I know what God has planned for me, I'm not afraid of dying. I haven't been afraid of dying in 40 years. I'm not afraid of dying. I, I, I'm ready to go any point because I know where we're going is a better place and I know what the Bible says about it. Look up on the screen, here's what Jesus said, John 14, one and two. Do not let your hearts be worried or fearful. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Now, if Jesus hadn't said it is finished, there'd be no place for you in heaven. So you better be glad he said it is finished. Because one of the things he did is he paid for your ticket to heaven. And he said, now I'm going to heaven and he's been preparing that place for you for about 2,000 years. It's gonna be some kind of place. You can't even imagine the perfection. I mean, you think of all the colors in this world and we only live in three dimensions. There are dimensions we don't even know about how incredible heaven is gonna be. But he says, God is preparing a room there for you. There's a place for you in heaven. So I don't have to be afraid. Now here's the third thing that Jesus did on the cross that he finished. And this is a big one for day to day right here while you're here on earth. And it's this. He broke Satan's power to mess up your life. 
That's one of the things that happened. And when you understand this, you can appropriate that power. I'm gonna talk about more of that on Easter Sunday. But he broke Satan's power to mess up my life. I don't know if you figured this out, but life's hard. Anybody notice that? Life's hard. Life is difficult. You ever feel like it's a struggle? You ever feel like you're in a battle? You feel like you're having to fight for everything? You feel like you're in a war? Well, guess what? You are. You are. There's a cosmic war that's going on between good and evil, between God and Satan, and you're a pawn in the middle. And that's why you get bumped around back and forth because God has far more power than Satan, but Satan is fighting. Now, I wanna say something that I don't want you to ever forget. Satan hates everything God creates. Satan hates everything God creates. Why? Because Satan cannot create anything. He's not a creator. He can't create anything. He can, he's a destroyer. He's a warper. He's a, he's a perverter. He can pervert things. He can abuse things. He can misuse things, but he can't create anything. God is a creator. Satan has never created anything. Satan hates everything God creates, including you because you were created by God. Why does Satan hate you? Because you were created by God. And he hates God's children. And if he can't get at God, he's gonna try to get at his children. He thinks he can hurt God by hurting you. And so if I wanna hurt you and I come after your kids, that's gonna hurt you. Satan wants to hurt you. He doesn't care anything about you. He just wants to get at God. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. And he's always trying to mess you up. And honestly, the truth is, without God's power, without what happened at the cross, you don't stand a chance against Satan. He's got far more power than you do. He's been arguing for thousands and millions of years. I mean, he knows every in and out. He can whip your mind around. He can throw ideas in you and you just buy it. He can flip your mood around. He can change your moods by influence, suggesting ideas and turn you real quickly into you know, anger or depressed or whatever. He can get, make, flip your moods around and your mind and everything. And you're defenseless without what God did for you on the cross. But here's what the Bible says. Colossians chapter one, verse 13. God rescued us from the dark powers of Satan and brought us into the kingdom of of his dear son. You know, it's kind of ironic also that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, I told you, Satan thought he'd won. He goes, I did it. I killed the son of God. Evil has triumphed. But he didn't know the whole story. And three days later, when Jesus rises again, he goes, I'm back. He's going, oh, I didn't see that one coming. And now he knows his days are numbers. And when he thinks of Jesus saying, it is finished, Satan's going, uh-oh, I'm finished. I'm finished. Because he's gonna be destroyed. In the meantime, there's two ways you need to know that's how Satan messes up your life. He uses this all the time. Uh, to be preoccupied with Satan or deny him, either one uh, is stupid because he uses two things in your life all the time. Temptation and condemnation. These are the two tools that Satan uses in your life, and they both come through attitudes. Satan can't force you to do anything, but he can put thoughts in your mind, and you don't have any defense if you don't have God's spirit in you. And so he uses temptation, which means he's trying to you know, lure you off the path to do something that's self-destructive, that'll hurt you, that'll hurt your relationships, that'll hurt your family. He's trying to tempt you all the time, get you to mess up, to get off the plan, because he knows it's gonna hurt you. And then condemnation, he's always whispering to you, you're nothing, you're worthless, you don't matter, nobody likes you, you're never gonna get married, you're never gonna mount anything, your parents were right about you, you're a failure, you're terrible, and on and on and on, and he's just constantly feeding those things to you. Where do you think those things come from? They come from the devil. And he's giving you condemnation and he's lying at you all the time. Satan cannot tell the truth, he can only lie. The Bible calls him the father of lies. And so he's constantly condemning you. Now you need to understand how this works. Before you commit some kind of thing that's wrong, break a law, break a rule, 
sin or whatever, uh, Satan goes, he's whispering here, it's no big deal. Come on, everybody does this. It's just no big deal. He minimizes it. The moment you do it, he starts maximizing it with condemnation. Are you kidding me? You just did that? You're never gonna be forgiven. Forget it. You think God's ever gonna use you? You think God's gonna bless you? Ha, tough luck, forget it. And he, he goes from minimizing it, it's no big deal, to maximize it, you will ne- that's the unpardonable sin. There's no way you'll ever get out of that hole. That's the way he works. That's the way he works in your life. But when you trust Christ, what Jesus did on the cross on Good Friday does two things. He gives you the power to resist temptation and the power to reject condemnation. I'm talking about the mental thoughts he puts in your mind every single day. Let me show you what the Bible says. First, because of the cross, I can resist temptation. I have a new power that I didn't have on my own. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, you can trust God now not to not allow any temptation greater than you, your power to resist it. That means God will never allow more on you than he puts in you to bear it up. You can trust God to not allow any temptation greater than your power to resist it. And also, when you're tempted, God will provide a way of escape so that you can defeat it. He wants you to win over Satan. So he gives you a new power that you didn't have before. You don't have to say yes. You have the power to say no. But not only that, because of the cross, I can reject the condemnation. I can stop that incessant flow of negative ideas that are flowing into my mind about me that are putting me down constantly. Jesus destroyed Satan's leverage to accuse you. The Bible says like this, Colossians chapter two, verse 15. God took away Satan's power to accuse you of sin and God displayed to the whole world Christ's triumph at the cross where your sins were all taken away. How does he defeat Satan this way? Well, if you have had your penalty paid and your debt forgiven, what can Satan accuse? If the account is not in heaven, if it's all been wiped out, there's nothing to accuse. Now, do you still mess up? Of course you still mess up. I still mess up all the time. But when the devil comes and starts to accuse me, I go, what are you talking about? God's forgiven it all. That one was paid on the cross. Go to hell, Satan. And he's the only one you can tell that to. <laughs> and you say, Satan, get out of here. He cannot accuse you because there's no condemnation in Christ. It's all been paid off. The account's been closed. There's nothing there to attack me with. Do I still physically do wrong things? Of course I do. But the account's been paid in full. It is finished, paid in full. It's been done. I've been freed from all that guilt. Now, let me give you a couple more and we'll close it. Uh, This one's fast because I want to emphasize the last one. Number four, on the cross, he created, number four, he created a family including all races. That family is called the church. God wants you to be a part of his family. It's going to last forever. It's going to outlast the United States It's gonna outlast the world. It's the only thing on the earth that's gonna last is the family of God. Everything else will one day be destroyed. And God included all the races. Now, I need to understand this. Before the cross, there were two groups of people. There's the Jews, who are God's chosen people, and there's the rest of us. And all of us, whether you're from Africa or Asia or Latin America or Europe, we're all in another group called Gentiles. So you're a Gen- if you're not a Jew, I hate to tell you this, you're a Gentile. I'm a Gentile, you're a Gentile, wouldn't you like to be a Gentile too? <laughs> and so we're all in this other mess. Now, the Jews were called God's chosen people. Is that right? Yes, they are God's chosen people. What were they chosen to do? To spread the good news about God to everybody else. But they didn't do such a hot job on that one. So plan B is the church. And God says, I really want everybody in my family. I don't just want Jews in my family. I want everybody in my family. Africans and Asians and Latinos and Europeans. And I want everybody. And this happened because of the cross. Look at what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter two, verse 14 and 19. Christ has made peace between Jews and Gentiles by making us all 
one family. We're all one family now. Breaking down the wall of hostility that separated people. Now, we're no longer considered foreigners or outsiders. You're not outside of God's chosen, frozen chosen. Now we're no longer considered foreigners or outsiders, but we can all be fellow citizens and members of God's family. We're all included now. And no matter what your racial background is, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Jesus Christ belongs to everybody. Salvation belongs to everybody. It's why we call Saddleback an all-nation congregation. It's why we welcome people from every background. We are against prejudice, against racism, against bigotry, because God has made us one family, and we say we want our church to look like heaven's gonna look. We're an all-nation congregation. No matter what background, you're, you're welcome here. Now, the fifth thing, here's one more. The fifth thing that makes Good Friday good news is this, that on the cross, when Jesus said it's finished, this is a big one, write it down. He guaranteed my salvation forever. I don't have to guarantee it. He guarantees it. I don't have to keep myself saved. He keeps me saved. It's not like you're gonna be saved today and then a couple days later you're gonna be lost again and then a week later after that you get saved again and then like two months later you commit a sin and you get lost again and it's like saved, lost, saved, lost and you can live a perfect life or a nearly great life and on the last day you just do the wrong thing and boom, go to hell. No, that's not it at all. Once you are saved, he guarantees your salvation forever. And eternity begins the moment you put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the waters. So the, as you put your, put your hand in Christ's hand and you say, I'm in. Here's what the Bible says, Philippians chapter one, verse six. You can be certain, circle that word certain. This is not a wish, it's not a guess, it's not a, I hope so. This is something you can build your life on. You can be certain of this, that God who began his good work within you will continue his work in you until it is finally, what's that word? Finished, circle that word. Finally finished on that day when Christ Jesus comes back again. What God starts, he finishes. God isn't gonna save you for a little bit and then let you go off in the ditch. Now you may mess up you may lose some fellowship, you may lose some rewards, but you're, you're a child of God. Once a child is born into your family, they might go rob trains and become a terrorist, but they're still your child no matter what. The fellowship may be strained, but they're still your child. You can't be unborn. And once you're born again, you can't be unborn again. You're saved and you're saved forever. Why? Because you're saved on the merits of Christ. Not his, and he didn't have any demerits. Now, follow me the logic of this. If the way I got to heaven was by doing certain things and by being good and by having a pretty good record up here, then obviously if I'm saved by works, the moment I stop working, I lose my salvation. But you're not saved by what you do. You're saved by what Jesus did. It is finished. It's finished. And there's nothing you can add to it. And there's nothing you can take away from it. Your salvation was completed on the cross 2,000 years ago. You can't do anything about it, sorry. You can't lose it, you can't improve on it. Once you have salvation, you can't lose it. Look at what the Bible says, Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. Saving is all his idea. And it's all his work. It's all God's idea and it's all his work. You don't do any work in it. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It is God's gift from start to finish. A gift is not something you earn. A gift is something that's given to you that you don't deserve. You don't deserve to be saved. I don't deserve to be saved. It's a gift. Why? Because of what Jesus did on the cross. Now you understand why it's Good Friday? Because you can't lose your salvation. It is finished. It's all been paid for. Now when you die, you're gonna have some unfinished business, no doubt about that. But there's one thing that's been finished for you a long time. It's been finished 2,000 years, your salvation. 
It's already been finished, and there's nothing you could add to it. I mean, can you imagine if I went to the Louvre in Paris, and I took some paintbrushes, I said, you know, I'm just gonna do a little improvement here on the Mona Lisa. <laughs> you know, it's redundant. There's nothing I can do to improve it. Or if I took some chisel in, and I went to the Vatican, and go, I'm just gonna improve on Michelangelo's David statue. That's the stupidity of thinking that you can do something to earn your salvation in addition to what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. Nothing else is needed. He did it all. And that's why he shouted, I did it. I did it. I paid it all. I paid your debt. I paid the penalty. I've broken the the power of Satan and all these other things. And I could give you a whole lot longer the list than just these five. You know, one time I was standing up on the patio one time and there was a guy, kind of a gangster type guy, I won't mention his name, but he was, he'd done some really bad stuff. And I won't say what they were, but he he knew it was bad and he knew that he needed a savior and he did not want to lose out on getting into heaven. And he comes up to me and goes, so, preacher. (laughs) And he goes, what do I need to do to be saved. And I looked at him and said, "Um, sorry, you're too late. He goes, you gotta be kidding me. I said, yeah, you're too late. He goes, no, there's gotta be something that I, can I buy it? I mean, you know, this is a guy who was used to getting his own way. Had plenty of money, tons of money. He just buy whatever he wanted. What can I do to be saved? I said, there's nothing, it was done 2,000 years ago, and you can't add anything to it. You just need to accept it. You see, friends, what I've been talking about today is the difference between do and done. This is the difference between religion and a relationship with God. I couldn't care less about religion. I'm not into religion. Religion is simply a list of do's and don'ts. Rules, regulations, rituals, and every religion has a different list. And what's on your list says you're that kind, and this list says this kind, and this kind. That's not in scripture. It's not about rules, regulations. It's not about rituals. It's about a relationship. And the difference is not do, 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 do. It's done. It's finished. It's perfect, it's complete, it's Good Friday. It's what the cross is all about. And friends, it's called grace. Aren't you glad that God isn't just righteous and just, but he's also loving? Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that he said, I'll take the rap, I'll do the penalty? Look at this verse on your outline, oh, and actually up here on the screen, John 10, 28. The Bible says, I give them eternal life. Jesus says this. And they will never perish. And no one can snatch them out of my hand. Friends, if you're gonna be secure in life, you need a foundation of security on which you can build a solid life as a woman or as a man. You need a foundation that's not gonna move. It needs to be rock solid. You can't build a successful life on sand. And shifting sand is the money you make and the opinions of other people, a lot of other stuff. But this is rock solid. And if you're gonna have real security, you've gotta put your security in something that can never be taken from you. If you put your security in your boyfriend, it can be taken from you. If you put your security in your bank account, it can be taken from you. If you put your security in your good looks, handsome, beautiful, he tell you this, it's already been taken from you. <laughs> and if not, you're gonna lose it sooner than you think. And if you put your security in how you look, that's not very secure. And if you put your security in your husband, you can lose your husband. And if you put your security in your health, you can lose your health. Here's what real security is. Putting it in something that can never be taken from me. I can lose my health. I can lose my wealth. I can lose my family. I can lose my life. I can lose my mind. But I can't lose my salvation. 
because it is finished. It's been paid for. And nothing's ever gonna change that. And I may really mess up and I could go way off the deep end, but I at one point said yes. And Jesus says, they're in my hand and nobody can take them out. Nobody is gonna take it away. Is that good news? That's good news. Now look at this verse. Right there on the screen, Acts 10, 35, it makes no difference who you are or where you're from, or I'll say what you've done too. If you want God and you're ready to do as he says, the Bible says the door is open. So let me summarize. Why is Good Friday good and what did Jesus complete on the cross? Well, let me just, these five. He paid my penalty and canceled my debt. So I'm, I don't, there's not even any account in heaven against me. There's nothing for God to charge against me. It's already been wiped out. Number two, he defeated the fear of death. I'm not afraid because Jesus is building a home for me up there right now. Number three, he broke Satan's power to mess up my life because now I'm gonna have a new power. If I get God's spirit in me, now I can resist temptation and I can reject, reject condemnation. I don't have to listen to those things anymore. They're wrong. They're, they're all, they're lies. He created a family to include me called the church, which involves everybody, and that gives me support. And then he guarantees my salvation forever. I'm sure when Jesus got back to heaven, the Father goes, well done. Well, well done. These are five things that give us hope, and there's certain hope. There are something, these five things are something you can build your life on. You can have security so that no matter what happens with the stock market or anything else, I know these five things are secure. I may lose a lot of other stuff, but I'm never gonna lose the love of God in my life. Nothing can separate me from his love. What do I do? I just accept it by faith. Jesus as my savior. I want you to listen to a song about this, it is finished, and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer uh, uh, about this to God. within my soul and let me hear the wonders of your redeeming love and let me hear those saving words you spoke upon the cross it is finished it is finished oh what else is there to say Shame is silence, death defeated, hallelujah, God be praised. No more condemnation, you have the final word, there's nothing
salvation you had the final word you had the final word it is finished it is finished oh what else is there to say shame is silence Okay, it's time for you to talk to God about what I just talked to you about. Don't you think you ought to thank him? Let's bow our heads. And why don't you right now, in your own words, tell God thank you for what Jesus did for you on the cross. because you don't deserve it, neither do I. Say, thank you, God, for sending Jesus to pay my penalty, to cancel my debt, and to wipe out the charges against me for all the dumb things I've done in life. Thank you that it is finished. Thank you that you defeated the fear of death. I'll just say that. Thank you that you defeated the fear of death. That I don't have to be afraid of dying because you're preparing a home for me in heaven. And thank you for breaking Satan's power to mess up my life. I don't have to give in anymore. With your spirit in my life, you'll give me the power to resist temptation and reject condemnation. Satan can't point a finger at me anymore because it's all been wiped out. Say thank you, God, that you created a family, including every race, called your church, and I wanna be a part of it. I wanna be a member of your family. And then tell God, thank you, for guaranteeing my salvation forever. That I don't have to keep myself saved, you will. That I'm in your hand and I'm never gonna fall out. That no matter what I've done or do, Jesus paid it all and it is finished. If you've never invited Jesus Christ in your life, say, Jesus Christ, come into my life. Put your spirit of love in me. I really wanna get to know you the rest of my life. I wanna learn to trust you, and I wanna follow your plan and purpose that you made me for. And I humbly ask you to accept me into your family because of your grace. Amen. Why don't we congratulate everybody who prayed that prayer for the very first time. Congratulations. That's a big deal. I'll never forget the day that I did that. Now, I don't want you to forget what I've taught you on this Good Friday. So we're gonna do three things in the last few minutes. I want you to open up your little sack, and your bag, and pull out the communion cup. We're gonna use that in just a minute. And there are two cards I want you to pull out. One's called Unlocking the Doors to Your Destiny, and the other's called Jesus Paid For It on the Cross. Pull out these two cards and this uh, communion cup. All three of these will help solidify what we just talked about. Now, the first one, I want you to take this card, the big card, that says Unlocking the Doors to Your Destiny, and I'm gonna ask you to check one or more of these five boxes. 
The first one says, today, I'm deciding to put my trust in Jesus as the door to everything God has planned for my life, including his purpose for me, forgiveness, strength, and an eternal home in heaven. If you just prayed that prayer and meant it in your heart for the very first time, check that box, congratulations. I'll send you some material that'll help you understand that. Number two, some of you checked the second box. I've already accepted Jesus as the door to my future, but I'm recommitting my life to him this Easter. Some of you say, Rick, I'm, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm intellectually honest. I, number three, I have some questions. I'd like to be a part of a study group that checks out the implications of trusting Jesus. This is a safe place. If you're intellectually honest, you came to the right place. We say take the time to make the right decision because if you, if you take the time and you give it, you're serious about it, you'll make the right decision. You can check that box. Number four, you say I'll be back next weekend for Rick's introduction to unlocking the doors to your destiny, an eight-week life-changing series. This may be the most important series I've ever taught you. Your life will be determined by the doors you walk past and the doors you walk through. And the key is knowing the difference. How many of you have ever gone in a wrong door? Yeah, all of us have. And there's a thing called discernment I can teach you on how to know what door to go through in your future and what doors to not go through. And number five, I'm not yet connected to a Saddleback small group. We have over 8,000 of these. But I'd like to be a part of one during this series. I'm not talking about the rest of your life. Uh, in my home or in work, uh, you can check that box. And in a minute, we'll finish filling that out. Now, we're gonna take communion right now, so I want you to take this cup, and Pastor Tom is gonna come and lead us in communion, which is a symbol of what we just talked about. The night before Jesus died, he was having a meal with his disciples, and uh, he knew he was gonna die on the cross the next day. They didn't know it, but he knew it. And so he wanted them to remember, to never forget what he was going to do for them. So he gave them and us a way to simply remember he took some bread and he said, eat this and remember that my body is given for you. And he took some juice and a cup and he said, drink this and remember that my blood was shed for you. And in doing that, Jesus was saying, I want you to take what I'm doing for you on the cross personally. This is personal. We do this together, but he did this for every one of us individually. And so, whether this is the first time you've taken communion or you've done it hundreds of times, I want to invite you to make it as personal as you ever have right now. Just sense that you and Jesus are sitting together and he's wanting to share this time with you. On the top of this, there's a clear plastic that you can peel back. And there's some bread there. As you take this, just sense Jesus sitting across the table from you, looking you in the eye and saying, I want you to know that this is my body and I gave it for you. So take this and eat this and let's remember him. And peel back the bottom part of the cup. Since you're making this personal with Jesus, you can sense him laughing with you right now and how hard this is to peel off. <laughs> because he's here, he's here. Right now, here you are across the table with Jesus again, he's looking you in the eye, and he's saying, this cup, this represents the blood that was shed on the cross, yes, for all mankind, but for you. So take it personally. Take this and drink this and remember him. Let's pray. Jesus, you love us. The, crowd, the cross shouts out to every one of us that you love us. And so right now, in sharing this bread and sharing this cup, we personally remember the depth of your love and we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for the cross. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, there's one other thing I want to do. And I want you to take this smaller card Nobody's ever gonna see this. Don't sign your name to it. Uh, after you write on it, I'm gonna have you fold it. We did this last year. At every one of our 19 campuses, we have put crosses all around. You can see these are nailed to the cross. There are 18 crosses here at Lake Forest. 
And in just a minute, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to take this and nail something you've regretted, something that you can't seem to forgive yourself for, or something that has continued to bother you or scared you or whatever, and nail it to the cross. I want you to look at these three things. First, in Christ we're set free by the blood of his death, so we get forgiveness for our sins. How rich is God's grace? So I graciously accept Jesus' forgiveness for the thing that Satan keeps bringing up and tries to make you feel guilty about, write it down right there. Nobody's ever gonna see this, just between you and God. In a minute, I'm gonna invite you to go and nail it to the cross. What has he been hassling you about? Whatever things that just keep coming up, coming up, you can't seem to forgive yourself, you need to write that down. Then the second verse, First Peter says, Jesus personally took our sins on his body on the cross so we could die to the grip of sin in our lives and be free to live the right way. You are healed by his wounds. Where do you need healing? It may be a relational healing between you and somebody else in your marriage with a friend, with a, a girlfriend or a parent. Maybe you need financial healing. Maybe you need physical healing healing in your body. Maybe you need emotional healing from a trauma or mental healing and your mind and thoughts are confused or healing in any area of life, healing of a hurt, of a dream. You write that down there. By his cross, we're healed. And then the third one, now that we are no longer slaves to the grip of sin, we're free to live a new life in freedom of God, so in faith I declare my freedom from. Maybe there's something there that's just been holding you back. A relationship, a habit, some hurt in your past, something that's just been a hang up in your life. You say, I need to declare my freedom from, the power to break free. We'll talk about that uh, more at Easter. I'm gonna ask you to sit still for just a minute The band has prepared a medley of songs about the cross. I want you to listen to the first of these. And while you're listening to this, you sit there and finish filling this out. On the back of the big one, there's a a, a place for you to write a prayer request. We pray. We take prayer requests seriously in this church. I pray for you. And so if there's something that we can help you with, write that down. Finish filling these out as you listen to this song.
my sins away. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. We're going to give our offerings now, but I want you to put each of these, this card, the big card in the offering, and after the plate or the basket's been uh, passed by you, uh, they're going to continue singing. I invite you to get up and take the smaller card and go and nail it to one of the crosses. Then I want to invite you, if you want to, to come back and have a seat and listen to these last final songs about the cross. This is a time to think about what God has done for you. Not to just rush off to in and out. <laughs> but to think about the significance of what Jesus did for you on this day about 2,000 years ago. We'll give our offerings and then you're free to get up and go and nail these to the cross. And if you wanna sit back down, that's fine.
like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online campus pastor and I would love to invite you to join our online community. Here are three ways you can take a next step. First, learn more about belonging to our church family by completing Class 101 online. Second, don't do life alone anymore by getting into an online only small group that meets on platforms like Skype or learn more about hosting a group with your friends in your home. Third, join our global Facebook community to connect with others with the online community and be more engaged in the day to day. To take any of those next steps, visit saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.